Perfect. Welcome, everybody. My name is Jessica Miklim Kolnich. I'm Europark's uh, youth officer, and I'm really excited today to share some new news with the network, um, especially regarding the Youth Plus program. For those of you who don't know the Europark Federation, um, I will just give you a little bit of an overview. We are over 50 years old as a network, and we include not just national parks, but also regional parks, marine protected areas, peri-urban parks, and Natura 2000 sites. Most of our members are authorities that manage those nature conservation areas. Some of them are NGOs that have their own land or NGOs that are just involved in nature conservation work. We also have a lot of uh, government agencies that are part of our network and some, for example, national park authorities are also seen as government bodies. As a network, we're all across Europe and we also have sections which allow protected areas in a specific region to talk in a local language, such as the German section, the Spanish section, the Italian section or the Francophone section and discuss issues that are more regional and more local um, and to also do events where you don't have to travel all across Europe to network and share. And that's really what our organization is about. It is about our members and we as the Europark Federation and the staff that work for it, we try and facilitate that networking, that sharing of experiences by creating spaces and events where news can be shared, case studies can be shown, best practices can be highlighted, people can come together and talk about their challenges and work on solutions regardless of the kind of protected area they are, which country they're in, um, the size of their budget, <laughs> etc. cetera. So um, yeah, within that program, uh, within, that range of programs, we've got um, our youth programs, which started with the Junior Ranger Network, but has grown to be much bigger than that. And the youth work is really embedded within Europark. We have involved youth in the work of protected areas as a part of our 2030 strategy. And just to summarize that, it's all about mobilizing young people, getting them involved in protected areas, building up their skills and capacity so that they can be experienced ambassadors for protected areas and have their youth voice reflected at all levels of decision making. So that's really where the different youth programs within Europark are aimed at. They're aimed at each one of these steps um, to get the youth voice heard. And as I said, we started with the junior rangers, but now we've got a whole suite and it can be seen as individuals. So some protected areas might only have some of these, whereas others might build them up step by step so that young people can engage at different levels as they increase in their skills and competencies. For example, if you start at junior rangers, that's usually when you're um, an older child or a young teenager, you'll go to an international junior ranger camp if you're lucky and you're selected to represent uh, then when you're older, you can start a Youth Plus group that's usually around 18 to 30, but we have some programs that start at 16 to 30 or some that even start at 14, 15, uh, depending on the local context. And we have every couple of years, we have an International Youth Plus camp as well, where they can get together and network. Then Europark also has a new Youth Council since about one year and a bit. And that youth council is also made up, half of them are young professionals, staff working for protected area, and half of them are representatives from our Youth Plus groups. And they are working on building this community of Youth Plus and finding ways in which young people can have their voice heard, running youth dialogues, etc. And they hopefully will get chances to meet at your park conferences and events. Uh, but we're still working on making that a more solid mechanism for youth involvement. And then lastly, Europark has the youth representative role. This role is really to connect the youth council with the official Europark council that oversees the work of the Federation. This representative sits on um, sort of Europark's board, so to say, and has to attend the board meetings, which are about eight per year, and also gets to meet in person with the rest of the Europark Council at official events. 
And this representative position is currently open until the 1st of no November. You can apply. There is a Google form on our website. If you just go to www.europark.org and you go to the youth tab, to the youth council, to the youth representative position, you can apply there to possibly be interviewed to be the youth representative. So please tell someone if you think someone else should do it and you have an idea of who that could be or apply yourself, we look forward to having your applications. And the Europark Youth and Parks Day is something new that we've started in the last year. It's on the 15th of September and it's a day for all of these groups, wherever they are and anybody else interested to run a local event to encourage young people to be active in protected areas or to highlight the work that young people are already doing in protected areas. And lastly, we have an advocacy tool, the Youth Manifesto, which is all about improving the lives in and around protected areas for young people so that they can live, learn and work in and around protected areas. So what we are talking about today is the Youth Plus program. We're going straight into it. Um, and it has been within the Europark network since 2013, so that's over 10 years. We have about groups in 12 countries, about 18 groups, although it does fluctuate, uh, especially post pandemic. We have about 200 young people involved in this program. And as I said, the average age is 18 to 30. This program was actually requested by the young people who were involved in the Junior Ranger program and has been co-created with mentors, parks and young people and has resulted in these four pillars. So a, a Youth Plus program should be including work on communications, nature conservation, advocacy and leadership. And the aim is for the young people to find their own agency. How this looks like can be very different between different programs. So what do those pillars actually look like? Here's a little bit of a guideline. And um, for example, communication, it could be using various communication skills, not just social media, but actually talking to the local community, running stands. It can be representing the protected area to the community or to the outside world, but it could also be communication within the park about young people, their importance as stakeholders and rights holders, um, and advocating for youth inclusion. Ad advocacy, um, is also pretty similar. I think there's a lot of communication in advocacy, but it's all about raising awareness, um, as I said, f about youth inclusion within the park, but also for protected areas. And it's usually linked together with policies, strategies, work plans, etc. Then we have the nature conservation pillar, which is obviously, you know, the aim of protected areas is often to protect the area and the, the biodiversity there and the cultural and the cultural heritage and it's all tied together uh, within the natural space. So young people should be involved in building that future and helping conserve it as well. And then lastly, within all of that work, there is leadership. So young people stepping up to help uh, stepping forward to lead either small teams or small projects and really building their own skills and building their own confidence. Let's have a look at the different uh, Youth Plus groups. So right now you can see a map of Europe. All the red landmarks are local Youth Plus groups and these might vary from just one to three Youth Pluses who are getting together and just doing something small like leading junior ranger programs or bigger groups running youth committees and youth advisory boards. And then we also have the three bigger landmarks that are national groups. So the Netherlands, Latvia, and in Germany, we have a national youth plus group. Um, and they like to get together and organize events or help across their country. The Netherlands and Latvia are not very big countries in comparison to some of the others. And so it's sometimes easier to work all together as a national group rather than just as one or two people within your own park. And so over the years, 
these different youth plus groups have been creating their own programs within the guidelines and focusing on different pillars and getting really good at them. And so we wanted to, as Europark, bring that knowledge together. Some groups were really great at communication. For example, Youth Plus Latvia have done a lot to increase um, the amount of communication about nature conservation in Latvian specifically, whereas other groups are really focused on the leadership. For example, the Ken Gorms Youth Action Team manage their own fund and um, do a whole selection process for how to spend that money towards youth projects and youth goals within their local community. So these Youth Plus groups could look quite different. And so as Europark, we wanted to bring together these, this knowledge and these uh, best practices and create a new toolkit that can be used by parks that are just starting out, by programs that are currently running and looking to improve on some of the other pillars that they're maybe not focusing on, or just to gain inspiration and see what else they can do as a Youth Plus group. So we applied for an Erasmus fund. Um, there's one called uh, KA153, which is about bringing youth workers together. And a youth worker can be a young person working with other young people, so the Youth Pluses themselves, but it could also be a staff member who works with young people or mentors them. So it was really nice um, funding that we could bring um, a lot of those experts all together to share their knowledge. And we had a four day seminar in the Müritz National Park in Germany, and the fund covered the travel and accommodation. And we took all of that knowledge and we turned it into a toolkit, which is now available. Here are just some pictures about um, the event in Müritz. As you can see, it was being out in nature, doing lots of workshops, <laughs> having lots of exchanges and discussions and dialogues. Um, yeah, and really sharing and inspiring each other and having fun. So this is the resulting Youth Plus Toolkit. It's an online website and that has got eight parts to it. At the bottom, you can see four blue buttons. Um, so each one of those is a different section that encompasses the Youth Plus program. And then each one of the loops is a page by itself going into detail on that pillar. Because we had so many partners, we were really excited to use their knowledge and also make it more accessible. So we have tried our very best to translate it into all the languages of our partners. And we have succeeded and uh, the finish is just almost done and coming in November. And we hope that that will really help with any barriers of new staff or new parks who are thinking of starting a Youth Plus program. So if you ever want to recommend it and the member of staff, the park director or the youth is not really that confident of their English, then hopefully they can speak one of these other languages here. And if you are interested in perhaps helping translate it into another language that's not yet representative, represented here, then do get in touch. And we're very happy to help. I will let you know that we've also used an automatic translator and done a lot of proofreading. But if every now and again you see something a bit odd, just let us know and let us know what it should say <laughs> uh, so that we can catch that as well and improve the website for everyone. So what exactly is included in this? Well, based on the workshops that we had, we had a deep dive into what exactly are the, the competencies of a Youth Pluser. And we have different examples here of different skills and competencies that they have for each of the four pillars. And then on each one of the pages, it'll take a deep dive into different aspects of, you can see the yellow is communication. So being an ambassador for a park, what does that mean? Going digital, what are examples there? Building skills, what skills, etc. So green is communication, uh, yellow is communication, green is nature conservation, blue is advocacy and red is leadership. And you can see the last button on all of these is monitoring and reporting because we think it's really important that we tell other people what's happening and that we can also tell our park directors and the youth themselves how we are doing from year to year, 
how individuals are growing and learning, how their skills are developing, etc. So monitoring and reporting is really important and we would like to encourage more groups to create their own um, indicators that they can measure over time because it really boosts everyone's confidence when you can see numbers that tell you, you know, you're doing better than last year or how things have impacted. Um, and it's not just numbers, we've got qualitative and quantitative um, indicators that can be used. So we do hope that this will be useful and that it will improve the quality of Youth Plus groups and their work plans. Here are just some examples. It's not a typical toolkit that tells you do step A, then do step B. It is more a collection of best practices, examples of different kinds of activities and triggers. For example, here we've got significant days in which you can do activities around or communications around. We've got a nice collection, um, for example, International Day for River Action, World Rewilding Day, etc. Just laid out in one spot where you can easily find it. I've got examples here from all four of the pillars, but there is so much more on there. And after this webinar, I invite you uh, to go and explore. <laughs> I won't send the link right now in the chat uh, because I don't want to distract you from the, west, the rest of what we'll be doing here. Um, but at the end, we will share the link with you and it will also be shared together with the recording at the end for anybody who's watching online. So yeah, that was the launch of the new Youth Plus Toolkit and I hope it will be used. Perhaps I could stop there and actually ask if anyone has questions on that. I know it was a huge amount of information really quickly and I tried to make summaries, but as you can see, I'm really passionate about this and I really hope that this is something that can be used. Today I have the tech support from my colleague Marit um, and Marit, I'd like to ask you, are there any questions in the chat that I may have missed or I can read out now? No questions so far, um, but yeah, please feel free to just post them. But so far there are no questions. Okay. Um, you're also very welcome to unmute yourself. So maybe if you just want to share what you think, um, you're welcome to just raise your hand, unmute yourself, and we'd love to hear from you. Okay, I see Mary Jane has written in the chat uh, that she's really excited about having competencies and KPIs. Um, I hope they will be useful. We brought together a lot of um, people who have Youth Plus programs. And I think with um, the KPIs, which are key performance indicators, for those of you who are not so familiar with writing projects, but that's usually what they ask for. And there's not always a lot of guidance on what you can use as a KPI. So we brainstormed some together with the whole group. And if there are any that you are using in your Youth Plus programs, you're welcome to email them to me and I can add them to the toolkit. Yes, the website is already online in all the languages except Finnish, which is coming. <laughs> um, and as I said, Marit will share the link at the end of this website. So when we, uh, the, of this webinar, not at the end of this website, sorry and you can go and have a look there. I will say that the desktop version is much better than the mobile version. And we were using the platform Canva because I'm not a website developer. <laughs> so I was using Canva to build the websites and it doesn't allow you to adjust the mobile version as nicely as the desktop version. So it, there is, it is possible to view it on your phone just things might not be centered aligned. And if you're a little OCD about that, I would suggest just looking at it on a computer. But if you want to send it to someone, you can also send it in WhatsApp and it's easy to, to get around. Great. So moving on to the next round, um, 
we're really excited to launch this new toolkit. Uh, but we also thought, you know, there's so much going on in this network and I spend a lot of my time speaking to youth, um, youth plus groups and also finding youth plus groups or groups that are similar enough to youth plus that could join the network and encouraging them to join. And over the last two years, I've met a couple of really cool youth groups that have been working in and around protected areas and who have decided to join the network. And today we have three of those with us today for the lightning round. And we just wanted to do a quick round where each one of them introduces their group, what they do, who they are, how they started. And so we can maybe l learn a little bit about them. And then at the end of that, if you have any specific questions for each one of the groups, you're welcome to as well unmute yourself, raise your hand or write it in the chat as it suits you depending on if you're sitting in a in an office with lots of people and you'd prefer to write in the chat feel free to do so but the option to unmute yourself is there so don't be shy so our lightning round has has got fabian from youth for nature it's got francie from the Vatten. And it's got Janis from Jugendnetzwerk Biosphäre. And it just happens to be a complete coincidence that all of them are German speaking. I promise you, I'm not biased. I did reach out to a whole bunch of other groups, but as this event is happening during working hours, I know it was very restrictive for lots of young people to participate. It was a challenge to find a time because obviously we would love as many park directors and park staff to be here, to be interested in young people and to learn about how they can run a youth, a youth plus program. And so we hope that the recording will be interesting for the young people to watch afterwards, those who couldn't be here. And that in the future, if the youth plus community wants to do events in the evening that we can support that too has been idea of a pub quiz for youth plus groups. So if you want to run that or you're interested in that, then send us an email afterwards and our youth council might take you up on that. So we have our lightning round here. I've introduced our three panelists and um, panelists. If you could yeah, open your video and as I mentioned to everyone, change your view to multi speaker for this. I'm going to be inviting you to speak in the order that I mentioned. So we have Fabi first, then Franci, and then Yanis. So our first question is, who are you? Who is your Youth Plus group? Where are you situated? How many people are involved? Tell us a little bit about yourself. So over to you, Fabi. Yeah, uh, hello, my name is Fabienne and I'm one of currently eight members of the National Park Youth for Nature group. So um, the National Park is in Austria, it's called Gesäuse and it's in the center of uh, Austria. It's the youngest national park and the third biggest. Um, our group, the Youth for Nature group, wants to um, address young people between the age of 15 and 29 who wants to participate <laughs> to um, uh, conservation. So, but we also have like projects which are for uh, younger people or also older people. Um, we are started in the year 2015, but last year it was re restructured. So we have like a new name um and a new logo and now we have also a budget from like five thousand uh, euros per year because we are sponsored by the insurance company guava um we are also on instagram so if you want to learn more about us and what we are doing you can visit us and follow us i can also send it in the group it's called like you for nature and then it's like an underline npg um, should I also explain now about the projects or later? Later, no. that'll be okay, the next sorry. question. <laughs> All good. Uh, let's go over to Franzi. Franzi, tell us a little bit about Vatten. Yes. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Franzi. 
and I'm part of the Watten network and Watten stands for like Watt from the Warden Sea and then network. And we are a network of volunteers from the Warden Sea and concretely from Lower Saxony, so in the northwestern part of Germany. And the network uh, exists since 2015. And currently we are about 30 to 40 active people, but in the whole network, since it it's already there since quite some years. I think we have about 700 people that already joined um, some of the activities we are doing. And yeah, we um, are connected to the Warden Sea National Park. So the Warden Sea is also north of Germany in the Northern Sea and also spreads across Denmark and the Netherlands. And most of our NEM members are uh, former federal volunteers or volunteers of the ecological year and also interns and all of them have mostly worked in the Warden Sea for like some months or half a year or a year and yeah that's basically it thank you very much Francie that was great uh Janis it's your turn uh Please tell us a little bit about Jugendnetzwerk Biosphere. Is there yeah. a shorter way to say your name as well? Because I stumble sometimes. <laughs> well, uh, we can say you've never Biosphere, but um, I think we have we we call us intern JNB. Dot NB, but uh, yeah. Um, so we are not not officially we have the shorter name. Yeah. Uh, hi everyone. Thank you for the invitation, and that I can like present the Youth Network Bias Reserve. Uh, you can network this here. Um, yeah, what can I say? We are uh, freshly founded 2023. We formed us. And uh, so we are now a year old, basically. And we are a decentralized group of young people, like aged from 18 to 30, uh, who are passionate about vice reserves in Germany. So, yeah, we all um, we have some connection. Some of us have connection to vice reserves. For example, they did an internship in vice reserves um, or uh, they lived in vice reserve, grew up there or just heard about it and, and want to and to be part of it. Um, currently, we are, since we are still so young, we are just uh, 30 active members, but like we have um, also people who are interested but not joined our network right now. Um, and yeah. We are we we are currently in the process of of, of a process of establishing ourselves ourselves as a formal association, and yeah, I think what all of us in the network connects is that we like firmly believe that bias reserves are like essential to fostering greater sustainable within society, and that these model regions of sustainability, um, yeah, they offer a valuable insight and. and um, solutions for addressing like uh, yeah today's challenges and also uh, future challenges and um, yeah so um, yeah talking about projects I think that uh, I will be later but yeah, so far that from will me. be Thank the you. next question. Thank you so much, Yanis. So exactly that. I think you're all really excited to talk about the different projects. And I'm really excited too, because you're all doing such interesting and cool work. So yeah, that's my next question. Simply put, what do you do? Let's go back to Fabi. Yeah, um, this year we had a lot um, of projects. Uh, I think it was like more smaller uh, projects. For example, in February, we start with a close web party, uh, which we organized. Uh, we also visit the Europe uh, Federation workshop in Mürz. Um, then we had like a fun activity. We were part of the Grazathlon in Graz. Um, yeah, and then we had like environmental education projects. For example, we invited like a group of children to the, it's called Waldläufer Camp. It's like an area where you can live in the forest and, for example, learn how to make fire. So this weekend was really cool. We hiked a lot, uh, lived in nature. 
And then there was also a primary school in the national park we invited to, and um, we did our own um, environmental education program and showed, for example, how um, the wood is, um, yeah. <laughs> And then our last uh, project in September and October was, for example, uh, um, uh, a movie night where we showed like nature movies and also um, had like inputs from experts. Yes, yeah. And then we have also projects in um, December, for example, where we visit the National Park uh, Christmas Market and presented our organization there. Thank you. That's really cool. I didn't know about the Christmas market. Now I need to plan a trip down to Austria to visit your Christmas market. Great. Uh, Franzi, would you like to tell us a little bit about the kinds of activities that Vatten does? Yeah, so the Vatten Network mainly organizes projects um, where people can meet in helping to protect the Warden Sea World Heritage. So we organize landscape conservation measures or like days where we collect trash at the beach. Then we do environmental education for volunteers, but also we do activities to reach out to the public and also environmental education for kids. So for example, this year, we were again part of the um, Ordensi uh, Kids Academy and there we just talked to kids about the conservation of the Warden Sea, did some projects with them. Then it's also about networking and cooperation with active members of the National Park. And also, yeah, current volunteers, but also former volunteers, they can contact us if they want to do some projects and then we can support them. And the biggest event we are doing each year is a yearly network meeting near the Warden Sea and there are nearly about 80 to 100 participants and it's mostly former volunteers that know each other and then it's just about networking, meeting friends and connect and be outdoors. Mostly we do birding tours because most of the people are really into ornithology. Uh, we meet with the local national park workers and do some excursions and basically just have fun for one weekend. Oh, yeah. And we have a Telegram channel where we inform each other about um, job opportunities or other stuff that is going on. That's really cool. Thank you. And Janis, since the Jugendnetzwerk Biosphere started, what have you been up to? Uh, we did a no, not a lot of things, but some things. Um, what I did forgot to mention because I saw that uh, Fancy posted the website of Vatten. In. We have also a website and an Instagram channel, and um, the website was created by Franzi <laughs> because Franzi is also part of the uh, network Biosphere. Uh, <laughs> that's quite funny. Yeah, so uh, I will post it later in the chat. Um, so what do we do since like we are so still in the early ages of, of our network? Uh, we did our activities uh, more on a smaller scale. So. To maintain the momentum of the network, we organize seminars in different bias reserves across uh, all of Germany. So far, we've held three of these seminars. And all of them, we had um, so 20 members uh, can join one of these seminars. And we, yeah, they will all be independently planned. So we secured the funding for it, we designed the program, we handled like every other logistical question or detail. And in these seminars, um, we, we focus on strengthening the participation connection to vice reserves, like through excursions and also on-site discussions with reserve administrations, with the vice reserve administrations, or we meet with local youth groups to um, yeah, try to uh, strengthen the youth participation in vice reserves within the administration. And as a core of value for us is mutual learning. So we share our ideas with the vice reserve administrations while gaining insights into new methods of youth particip participation from the vice reserves. So it's like, yeah, it's a win-win situation for, for the network and the vice reserves. And these 
spirit like of exchange is um extends also within an, our own network because um through for example the open space the sessions we share uh, our own knowledge is about diverse topics for example uh birding um a species identification plants um but also something that's not related to nature also like yoga workshops um yeah so i would say it's very diverse and we use these seminars also to grow as a network and to, to build it because we we need this time or we use this time also to meet in plenary sessions so with all the people who are there and discuss like larger network projects or, or issues and then afterwards we meet in in the seminar we also meet in, in smaller groups because like the uh, youth network is organized organized in working groups and these working groups can then meet um, in these seminars and discuss topics like finances or public relations. So yeah, that's like I think these these seminars uh, we did three of them and these are like right now our core activities. Um, but we have ideas for for future workshops um, and they might come like regional building or. A, a, a species identification workshop. So there are a lot of ideas, but right now we did a three of the other segments. Yeah, that's so far. Thank you, Franzi, for posting the website. Thank you so much. That's really exciting. I've been following your progress uh, since the youth forum where you said you're going to establish a group. And it's been really awesome to see that you've, you know, taken off running and gone ahead and successfully completed a couple seminars already. So I'm very happy for you and really excited about the future. Then let me move on to my third question. It's how did you start? And I think some of that has been mentioned for some of your groups already. And um, so maybe you could also complement that with why did you personally join? <laughs> if you can identify that as well. And OK, so we will start with Fabi again. Yeah, so as I mentioned, our group started in the year 2015 and where we we constructed uh, last year. Um, I personally joined the group because I worked last year in the National Park for a season and um, I visit a lot of um, projects. From, from the group and decided it's what I want to do too in my free time. I think it was like really um, directly you get like uh, to see if it's a good thing or a bad thing, for example, to invite the um, primary school to the national park and see, oh, they learned a lot and it's, it's really cool. Thank you, Fabi. I really like the new revamped uh, Youth for Nature with your really cool brand design and matching outfits and photo shoot and super cool Instagram. So I do recommend that everybody goes and checks out their Instagram. And Francie, over to you. Yes, so how did we start? I actually only was told, so I cannot give first-hand experience because I'm uh, part of the network since one year now and but they said to me that it was founded in 2015 and that there were already some connections between the volunteers from the different islands in the Warden Sea and those people met on seminars during their voluntary year and then there was the idea of why don't we continue why don't we meet regularly because we have the strong connection and we further want to do something for the Warden Sea and for the protection of this really nice nature conservation area. Um, and I think then they just also had meetings where they started to develop the network and then more and more people were coming in. And I personally joined because in 2020 I did an internship on one of these islands and I was also really fascinated by the Warden Sea. I really loved it there. And the people were so nice. And then I kind of lost connection a bit. But during the sim, the youth forum in the Felserwald, where you've already also been, I met some people that were part of Watten, and they invited me to one of their 
seminars and I was there for one weekend and I really enjoyed it and it was really nice. So I just sticked to the network and I'm really happy to be part of it. That's really great. I don't think you can get better advertising than that. Join, we have fun and you'll like it. <laughs> great. And Yanis, over to you. Yeah. Um, well, with you, Francie and, and Jessica, you also men already mentioned the third Matthew firm, but let's go a bit back. So um, we had in Germany the big opportunity to have three MAP youth firms on a national level. So MAP stands for the UNESCO MAN and the Biosphere Program, and under which the Biosphere Reserves are designated. And we had the opportunity like to have uh, these three um, MAP youth firms 2019, 2021, and 2023. And um, during like these third forum um, in 2023, um, I think it was in September, um, like a small group of the participants um, proposed an idea of a youth network. And um, so we proposed it there, we had like a little meeting there. And we also had uh, the big uh, luck that afterwards uh, in November, 2023, we had already the foundation meeting in one of the bias reserves in Germany, close to the Baltic Sea. And this was amazing because um, in this founding meeting, we like we tackled all these um, kind of foundational questions. You need to have like a youth network running. So what is our target group? How do we set up uh, yeah, communication strategies? And, um, and that was it basically. And then we, we formed our working groups and kept on, kept on working, had the uh, three seminars in 2024. And yeah, it was pretty amazing. And these, Three youth forums, um, they were good as a uh, initiator because we had a great pool of motivated people like Franzi um, and they made it quite easy to launch this network because we were so motivated about it. And um, we also had like the, the big um, uh, fortunate in our, our early stages that the umbrella organization of large protected areas with uh, National Naturlandschaften e.V., who is also a member of the Geopark Federation, um, uh, supported us with resources and guidance and so on. And now to the question, why did I, uh, I um, join the network? I was one of the initiators of this youth network. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I think, Vice reserves are a sign of hope, um, and they are uh, a, a beautiful idea to create sustainability, to integrate sustainability in society, um, and also, uh, yeah, nature conservation. So they go basically hand in hand. So yeah, it's for me a very, uh, very ideal solution. That's all. Thank you very much, Yanis, Fabi, and Franci. That was a quick lightning round into your new Youth Plus groups that have joined um, the Europark Youth Plus network recently. And now I'd like to give the space for anyone in our audience to ask any three of them a question. So feel free to raise your hand and then we will give you the floor. Okay, I don't see any questions yet, but if you still do have a question, um, I, please. I have one. Go ahead. I have one to Fabi, because I really, um, really enjoyed your, your lightning round about um, your, yeah, uh, your network. So um, what is like your target group and what, what members do you have in your bias reserve? Uh, sorry, in your uh, youth network? Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? Just yeah. Um, so um, I really love to talk about it. So what kind of members do you have in your, your youth network? So what's like your target group? What age? And maybe you mentioned it already and I didn't uh, uh, listen to it very carefully. Okay. So um, our members are between like 22 and 20, uh, 
I think the oldest one is in the moment 28, but you can visit us when you are 20, uh, 15 to um, 29. And like the group where we do our projects for also between 15 and 23, but we have, we have um, also project, for example, for primary school. So we just um, try to uh, have like project for like the general youth groups. So I think something that makes um, Fabi's group really interesting is that they are in a very sparsely populated rural area in Austria. And it's really hard to even find young people who are interested who live in the local community. So instead of, you know, making an open call and having, you know, a thousand young people sign up to be interested, they were very strategic about forming their Youth Plus group. The very first ones, I think you had someone who was interested and you called your friends and they called their friends. And, and that's how you sort of revamped the group and got everyone together. Um, and yeah, I've been following you on Instagram and I'm really excited. And you seem like a really awesome group. Do you have, now that you've revamped and started um, again as a group, do you are you open to new members joining, Fabi? Do you have a regular call where someone can join the group? Um, I think you can, like, um, send a message to, I think we have also, like, a website from the National Park Assoise. There you can also uh, write, like, Denise. She is um, a worker from the National Park Assoise, and she is also... Um, joining us in the group and take care of us <laughs> a little bit. And then you can come to us. I think we have like, uh, it says like 10 members is uh, what's allowed uh, that we have. So in the moment, yeah, it's a place that you can join us and um, take, uh, yeah, can join us. <laughs> Thank you so much, Fabi. So from the junior ranger program when the youth plus um, program developed we created a model in which similar to the junior rangers there used to be a mentor who was a park staff who would then lead the group or help support and empower the group but then we also have groups like you get netzwerk biosphere which is national and so not linked to any particular group, although you are supported by the Europark Germany section called Nationale Naturlandschaften or NNL for short. Um, and then you have the Watten, which is Francie's group that she's representing, um, which came about completely spontaneously by individuals who were volunteering and who self-organize and um, do all their planning and their funding by themselves uh, without a member from the park staff authority helping them. Although Francie, maybe you can tell a little bit if you know about the relationship that you have, like the support to adult organizations uh, within the Vatten. Yeah, we are part <clears throat> of the Förderverein Nationalpark Wattenmeer. Do you know what is in English? So it's like the foundation or the charity linked to the protected area. Yeah, so we are part of that, like an undergroup. And I think they helped us a bit starting it because they also have um, our bank account and help us managing that. So we are not um, an association, like uh, an official formal association, but we are part of them. So that helped a lot with all the organizational stuff and the formal stuff. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I'm going to end the lightning round now. A big, big, big thank you to Francie, Fabi and Janis who volunteered to be here. And it's really awesome to get to know each one of you better. I hope to see all of you and I might see your faces on social media and I will definitely be liking your posts on Instagram. Uh, so maybe we will have opportunities to meet in the future. So just a very big thank you from my side. Then I think we are into the third and the last part of this online roundtable, and that's to talk about funding. I think you heard a couple of little things mentioned by the Youth Plus groups now. 
um, about how Fabi and her Youth Plus group, they have a sponsorship, which is really awesome. But I thought to just take this time to go through a couple of examples. I am by no means a funding expert. So everything that I will present to you today, I have heard about or learned about by you, from youth groups or youth networks or even within the Europark network. So I can, if you're interested in any one of the particulars, I can find a Youth Plus group that's doing that, that could help you and answer more of your questions or a resource uh, where you can go and ask more questions. So this will be the very, very important one for lots of groups starting out. Uh, so let me start my presentation. And as usual, put your questions in the chat if you think about them while I'm talking. And if you think about them afterwards, you can also voice them just by unmuting yourself and raising your hand. So now we're going to talk about funding. So I like to think about funding in three separate categories. The first one is going directly to your park and talking to them about their budget and the money that they manage. Then there's the opportunity to do self, self uh, fundraising. So getting people to give you money for anything you want to do. And then lastly, there's an option of project funding. And project funding is usually project specific with a very fixed term and a very specific thing that the money is supposed to be spent for or who can apply for it. So let's go into park budget. So here within our network, we've had cases um, where the park themselves have assigned an annual budget. Uh, we have this case in the Julian Prealps Nature um, Nature Regional Park, and the young people there are able to manage that money, decide how to spend it by themselves with the approval of the park and yeah, together with them. Um, there are also options within the park to maybe take on a mini role or a mini job or an internship, etc., in which you can also get staff time at least covered because that's often quite a challenge. Um, I know in some countries, I don't know how frequent this is, but in Germany, we have something called a mini job, which is 450 euros, about 10 hours a week that you can get paid without the park having to pay any of the social benefits, etc. And it's usually ideal for students or um, for anyone trying to get um, a little bit of their time covered. There are also some countries in which you can get a volunteer fee that is also tax different um, and can be opportunities in which time can be compensated, um, especially if your volunteers are young people who are also trying to cover their own rent and groceries, et cetera, and starting out in their careers, or um, they are unemployed people currently searching for jobs, often in the nature sector, et cetera. Then, uh, as Francie was saying, you can work through the Park Foundation or the Friends of the Park charity. So there are um, groups that can help you manage money or get money or potentially assign a portion of their money to you for any activities. And then there is the last option that I've heard about, which is when you are written into large park projects. For example, if your park is going to start, like apply for a fund to help them with, um, for example, pollinator awareness, then in as they write that application, you can write to them and say, hey, <laughs> can you assign a portion of that money for a youth group to do an outreach project? And in that way, you can get a portion of money or be involved in a project or have ownership of a project that is then linked to the plan and the park budget. There you have the self-raising, self-fundraising. <laughs> I keep thinking of self-raising flour because I like to bake, but it's self-fundraising. And uh, this is where you try and get the money yourselves. For this, it's really important to think about how you manage the money. Um, you can register yourself as an association or a charity or as 
previously mentioned, you can work with a local partner to help manage your funds. There are lots of youth organizations or youth groups that are also able to help other youth groups starting out um, manage their money, um, etc. And then how do you actually get money? Well, I have advice from uh, one person who's very knowledgeable, and this is the mentor of the Danish Junior Rangers, which is just get to know the local people in your community. You'd be surprised how many people are really excited to give money to young people, especially, you know, retired lawyers who are really interested in birding and would love to help you run a youth session on birding or something like that. So there really are people out there willing to give you a little bit of money and together you can do projects based on the amount of money that you have. Uh, there are also opportunities to do a bigger campaign, do a GoFundMe with a very specific um, goal that you have in mind to really mobilize the whole of commu your whole community and set a target and, and raise funds. And to do that, you can also do things like do your own guided tours and then ask people who participate to donate money, like with free walking tours that happen in most capital cities. Why not free walking tours in your national park? Um, running on donations. And then lastly, um, you see a lot of events where you can go do a marathon as a team event and ask for sponsorship or ask for uh, funding or do an hour long event where for each hour people will give a certain amount of money to see how long you can go or how long you can do something. Uh, yeah, these are just some ideas. Some of them have been done in our community and I hope that this does inspire some of you to consider. And then lastly, there's project funding. For this, if you are a Europark Junior Ranger program or a Europark Youth Plus program, I have been collecting a list of potential project funds that you can apply to. Most of them are, have open calls every year. And um, that the link to that is found in the newsletter. So if you're receiving the newsletter, go all the way to the bottom and click on the link there. If you're not receiving the newsletter, but you are, are a Youth Plus program, then write to me. And if you're not a Youth Plus program and you would like to be, write to me. <laughs> and uh, we'd love to have you in the network and we'd love to support the network by adding any funding to this database. And within this database, I've got a list of project funds where the funders want to have something specific, like, for example, they want women empowerment in nature conservation. So it has to be, you know, a project that looks at empowering women, for example. Uh, so often they're very, very targeted and you have to match your idea of your project to what they want to have. Then there are other ones, the opposite way around, where it's a prize for a project that's already been completed. And so that's where if you win the prize or if your project meets their criteria, they will give you um, a bit of money or sometimes it's um, you can spend the money on specific tools that you need, camera traps or um, Photoshop or something like that that you'd like to use as an organization. Then within project funding, I'd like to say to look at local, regional, national and international youth funds uh, or nature conservation funds. But I think for youth groups and the work that you do, you might find more within the youth departments. I know the more local you go, the more you have really personal contact with someone where you can say what your needs are and they can let you know how they can help that. Whereas the more international you go, it's more project specific, like they'll have their agenda and you have to meet their needs. And then, um, yeah, some projects are youth led only. So this is where we want to get with lots of our youth plus programs is it's great to have a mentor and support and direct access to your park, but we also want the leadership skills to be boosted, supported, empowered, so that young people are leading their own projects. And if you are at that stage as a Youth Plus group, there are some funds that are for youth-led projects or programs only. And then something that I'll go into now are the Erasmus and the European Solidarity Funds. So the Erasmus Funds 
are specifically for international projects. So rather than thinking locally about your own Youth Plus groups, you can think about, oh, hey, I've just gotten to know three new Youth Plus groups and I know a couple more from my time as a junior ranger. Why don't we do something together? So this is a really cool pot of money and um, that you can apply for. Um, it's for all Erasmus and partner countries and which includes almost all of Europe and fortunately not the UK. However, UK participants can join. They just have to be self-funded. And if you're using the funds to already cover all of the accommodation, etc., then you can also reduce their costs of participation and they can be involved in other ways. And maybe they can even find sponsors uh, locally that will be able to send them. So don't forget about the Youth Plus uh, groups in the UK who would love to join on your projects as well, potentially. For this, there are deadlines usually in February and March, and most countries also have an October deadline, but you've got to plan quite far in advance because it takes about six months to hear whether you get the money and then you can only start planning. So the best time is to apply in the October deadline so that you will get to know in January and February whether you got the money and then you can start planning for your event to take place in the summer. That's the best way to do it in my experience. And within the Erasmus, there are different key actions called KA1. Oh gosh, I realized my slide says one for all of them. Well, it's one, two, three, if you can count. <laughs> we'll just use some addition here. Um, yes, so KA1 is a once-off mobility event. I told you the one project that we had for Pillars for Youth Plus was KA153, which is a subgroup of KA1, which was about youth workers. There's also one about just bringing young people together. And all your transport and all your accommodation is paid. Unfortunately, no staff time is paid, which is ideal for volunteer groups. Um, who don't have to pay staff, not because I don't want you to be paid, but if you're already volunteering, whereas organizations who want to use this have to find additional funding to pay their staff time. Um, and it's about 40,000. If you have a small group of about 20, it'll be about 24,000 euros, but it's always pre-calculated your budget. For each person, you'll get 100 euros, you'll get 65 euros per day for the accommodation and food, and you will get usually around 120 euros for their travel. And so it's all pre-calculated, uh, which makes it really easy to apply. And most of those projects are around six months. Then you've got the KA2, so the second one um, here in the middle. And these are smaller partnerships, and they're usually to develop capacity or tools between partners. And here there are three levels. Obviously, the pot of money gets bigger the longer time your project is, and the more partners you have, and the bigger the thing that you're trying to achieve. But these are really cool if you want to mentor another group. We've had, uh, for example, Junior Ranger mentorship from one country to another using um, the 60,000 euro budget, I think, or the 120,000 euro budget. And But this time you would probably need park staff to help you here or paid staff because you have to make your own budget um, more specifically and, and develop a really good project proposal. And then lastly, KA3, the third one here in the option all the way on the right, um, is very specialized. Uh, so it's about um, supporting policy development and cooperation. And those budgets are like 15 million. And it's very specific. So they have certain cores of things they'd like to achieve. Um, and you'll probably need like bigger organizations, like for example, the German section, National and Naturlandschaften, to be really involved in something like that. But then what's also really exciting and relevant are the European Solidarity Corps. And even within here, three seems to be a really lucky number <laughs> within the European funds. Uh, but there are three different ways in which you can take part. Um, the European Solidarity Corps is for 18 to 30 year olds uh, within it's Again, it's the same countries as in Erasmus, so unfortunately at this point in time, not open to the UK. Um, 
how it works is that you'll have a host that applies for the positions and then you as a young person you can see those positions they're available on a website uh, you can find them you can apply for them or they advertise on their own websites and programs i know for example birdlife malta we've helped them advertise for any spots for long-term volunteers to go to malta and work for birdlife there um yeah and and yeah, as a young person, you need to find an organization to send you that is also registered for the European Solidarity Corps, but that's not as difficult as it sounds. And if you're interested, once you look into it, you'll find a way to make it happen. So within here, I said there were three projects. For the Youth Plus groups, I want to put a massive spotlight on solidarity projects because this is exactly accessible funding for any Youth Plus group uh, within the EU and it is about 600 euros per month. You don't need to be a registered group. You just have to be a minimum of five young people between the ages of 18 and 30 applying. Literally, if you, one of you drops out and you're only four, the money has to be returned. So make sure you get five committed people. Uh, but other than that, you only need to have a bank account that you can prove is only used for the project. Um, which you can you can open up a free bank account with one of the banks and yeah you can do a solidarity project and the cool thing about a solidarity project is that anything climate change or nature conservation related counts as solidarity because you're doing it for the benefit of all of society so <laughs> I think everybody should apply for one of those and get informed I just want to note that for any of this, if you want to know more information, every single country in the EU has got a national agency and they've got a whole host of people that are there just to help you apply for these things. So if you write to them, they're very happy. They'll invite you to webinars where they explain things. They will have telephone calls with you. They will write, they will respond to your email within 24 hours. If you ask, what does this question mean in the application? I can speak from experience. They're amazing people who really want you to get this money. They really want to give it to you. So please apply. <laughs> and then we've got the two options of volunteering. One is long-term volunteering. That's more of an individual basis. This is where it's really important about the host and the sending organization. The host will apply for a quality label. So if you work for a park, please ask them if they're interested in this and if, whether they would apply for a quality label. And they just have to prove in the quality label that they've got the infrastructure to host an intern or here, a long-term volunteer. And the positions are between two and 12 months. Uh, you get money that covers your accommodation, your travel, your insurance, and you also get pocket money paid out. So that's really nice. Uh, the only thing there is that you really have to do it in another country, not your home country. But I think for most of you, that's probably a plus. And then there are team volunteering events, which is for groups between 10 and 40 volunteers, where, for example, if there's um, a place that would like a project in the summer to be done and they don't have time to have a long term volunteer, uh, but they want to do some maintenance work or to they have a building project or, you know, it's going to be really intense bird migration coming past and they need people <laughs> to help count all the birds. And then this is the sort of event that you can apply for um, volunteers to come and help. Within that, there's also money for accommodation, travel, insurance, and pocket money. And you need to have an international team so that it's at least two countries coming. And if you are a very remote place, you need to have at least one volunteer that's local or from your country. Um, yeah, so you can get involved in those. And if anybody would like more information of this, they, about this, they can write to me and they can also write to their national agency. So yeah, that was a really quick overview about different potential funding streams. So yes, I saw the question in the chat from Mary Jane. I'm always thinking about how to consider our UK um, youth pluses because we have at least four groups in the UK that we really, really want to get involved. And um, with the European Solidarity Corps, they are unfortunately excluded. Uh, maybe 
possibly they can get involved in a local project by coming over and volunteering or they can do it join on a team event uh, but then it would have to be self-funded um, with the Erasmus projects as well at this point there's no additional costs but having had gone through that process myself I think as long as you do your planning in advance and if you apply in October and start planning in January, February and only have your event in the summer, then you can give enough time for any UK participants to say they want to join as well. Are there any questions? Now is your time. Feel free to raise your hand and ask a question. So we can find the where I can uh, raise my hand. But, All good. Uh, it's usually at the react button. That's now a heart. So you might be scared to send a heart to me, but if you do yes. click on that react ah, button, you okay. will see the raise hand button. Well, I use do not use uh, Zoom so often. No um, just a question to the solidarity fund because uh, we're thinking about applying for it mm -hmm. um, for a bigger meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but our problem is that it might be not enough money. So is it possible like that you can use this and then add up with another funding? Yeah, Okay. I think definitely. I haven't seen anything to say the contrary. Um, I don't know if you looked into it specifically. I did say per month, there is a specific fee per country. Like each country has their own fee. I think I said roughly around 600. I think that's for Germany. And also consider it's not just the time in which your project happens. So for example, if your solidarity project is you're going to run a junior ranger camp or you know a camp for kids in your park, it's not just that week that's going to be paid. You can say that project will take you six months to prepare and you'll get 600 euros every month within that planning process that you can spend how you want. So if you need that money to cover 2000 euros for the accommodation, then, you know, try and make sure that you have at least four months of planning. Um, yeah, but I would say call the national agency in Germany. There's a lovely lady called Vanessa who will answer all your questions. She's really excited about this fund. And I'm really excited about the Youth Pluses using this fund. So please do look into it. Amazing, thank you. Any other questions? Has everybody found the raise hand button now under React? If not, you can just unmute yourself. I see a question in the chat. So the first project is a local project. The second and third are between two protected areas, right? What about hosting structures? Are there some standards? For example, CETS, I think you mean the um, sustainable tourism or I think CETS is specific to Ita Italy possibly, but yes. Um, so there are standards and that's why the hosting organization has to do the quality label process and that's a three-month process and you have to do it before you apply to have volunteers which means unfortunately there's only a week left this year if you want to host volunteers next year um, to get your park or protected area organization to do the quality label before the 31st of October so that they can apply in the February, March deadline to host volunteers. But you only have to do the quality label process once and the application for intern for, for volunteers is also super simple where every year you can just say again, <laughs> basically you don't have to go through the whole process every single time. Um, and with in terms of the hosting structures, there is flexibility. For example, for a long-term volunteer, you might not need to provide the accommodation, but you need to at least help them find the accommodation. For something like a team project, they definitely don't have time to look for accommodation. So it's better that you've helped find like a backpackers or if they're going to be camping that you can provide tents or something for them to um, to yeah have accommodation during that time.
and you mentioned here that it's between two protected areas. This entire structure with Erasmus is not necessarily set up only for protected areas, but the EU really does want there to be more of these volunteering opportunities within uh, protected areas, and they're recently hosted an event in Poland to try and get more protected areas to know about these opportunities. So if you are in contact with park staff, do tell them about it. <laughs> do tell your park staff to talk to your national agencies. Um, I think often the biggest challenge is just the capacity to manage volunteers and to get the directors to to ensure that staff has time to look after volunteers. But I think it can be really rewarding for the park and for the young people. Um, and who knows? I mean, as Fabi and Francie mentioned, the reason they got involved was because they first started as an intern or a volunteer and then want to continue to engage. So by making opportunities, even if they are temporary, open to young people in our protected areas, um, that can lead to even bigger and better things. Unfortunately, yes, not everybody as excited is ex as excited about youth opportunities as me. Um, and that's why we do as much awareness raising as possible at networking and trying to find the person that has an open ear to this. It's not always easy. Um, but I do hope that each one of you has success and that that empowers you to, to convince more people to make things open for young people. Are there any other questions? Yes, you can rewatch this. Everybody who has signed up um, will be able to, will get an email with the recording. It will be on our YouTube channel and it will be posted through our website. So if you ever want to find it again, uh, you can search Europark on YouTube and webinars. It'll be there or um, make a quick save link and save it in your bookmarks so that you can save it and send it to anybody else. Yeah. Great, then we will close it for today. Yes, seven minutes under time. That's awesome. The German in me is very happy. <laughs> and I would just like to ask Marit now to take the moment to share the links. Uh, the one will be the link to the new Youth Plus Toolkit. So I hope you're excited to go and check that out. Um, yeah, if you notice anything that you think should be changed in there, please let me know. We're still doing final edits uh, until the end of the year. And I'd also like to ask you to give some feedback on today's event. Was it what you expected? Did we get it right with the market marketing? Um, yeah, how did you hear about it? How were we able to reach you? That's all valuable information and we'd love to hear from you. With that, Marit, you can stop the recording.